Coming up on today's episode of the Salesman Podcast. Learning to ask questions and learning to understand why we have to ask questions and the right types of questions to ask is absolutely key. And, you know, we've been training uh, salespeople for, you know, 50 years this year. And we find that the ability to ask really good questions, it's a very rare commodity. Hello, Sales Nation. I'm Will Barrow, host of the Salesman Podcast, the world's most listened to B2B sales show. If you haven't already, make sure to click subscribe. And with that, let's meet today's guest. Hello there. Uh, my name is Antonio Garrido. I'm the author of Asking Questions, The Sandler Way. You find it lots of places. Check us out on www.absolute.sandler.com or LinkedIn. On this episode of the show of Antonio, we're diving into questions and not just ask these four questions and something magical is going to happen on the back of it. We're diving into the methodology behind what questions we should ask, when and why we should ask them, how we can use questions to build trust, how we can ask difficult questions that have profound answers for us and the person we're asking them of and a whole lot more. So with that, let's jump right in. To tee things up and to add, I guess, a bit of suspense to the conversation, in the grand scheme of things, out of everything that a B2B sales professional learns throughout their careers, how important is the ability to ask great questions? Well, it's, a, it's, it's the single most important thing. And um, the, the, the problem is, or the challenge that we have is we're really not good at it. We're, we're good at asking very superficial, how are you? Would you like a coffee? Did you find your way here? Okay, type of questions. But, but they're, they're not on any way, well, other than maybe slightly bonding and rapport, but tiny bit that they have no real value or real use. So learning to ask questions and, and learning to understand why we have to ask questions and the right types of questions to ans- to ask is absolutely key. And, uh, you know, we've been training uh, salespeople for, you know, 50 years this year. And we find that uh, the ability to ask really good questions is, is in very, uh, very, uh, it's a very rare commodity. So how do we then, before we get into the, the types of questions we should be asking and that side of things, how do we know if we are incredible at asking questions or if we suck at it? <laughs> um, uh, let's work on the assumption that we're, that we're I'm not going to say we suck at it, but everybody needs help. Okay, so we all need to uh, improve our question uh, asking uh, 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 ability. Um, I think the first thing we need to do before you can fix anything is recognize what the problem is, right? So um, if we think about there's a, there's a, there are a few things going on, and once we recognize what's going on, once we first get that aha moment, which hopefully I'm, we're going to share with you chaps today, once we first once we recognize what's going on, we can then start to come around to you know what that solution what that solution might look like. So I'm going to assume that. We all, you know, we're all pretty good. The problem is when we have this conversation with people is that everybody thinks they're a good driver, right? Yeah. But not everybody is a good driver. We can't all be terrific drivers. So, so recognize the problem and hopefully during the course of this interview when, when we discuss it in more detail, listeners and viewers will, will recognize that there is a problem um, and, uh, and then we'll, we'll get to figuring out what the solution looks like. But let's, let's, let's work on the basic assumption that we all need help. How's that? Perfect. Okay. So with that said, is the ability to ask great questions, does that come down to memorizing 15 questions that are on some YouTube video like this, and then we're incredible at it? Or is there a, a methodology? Is there a framework? Is there a structure to, to becoming skilled at asking great questions? Um, yes and yes. So, so let, let me start by, let me start by asking you a question. Of course I have to do that, don't I? Right. I'm the worst person to interview because I'll never ask a straight <laughs> question, but so, and, and people that are listening, right. And watching now, um, think about this. So let's imagine that you're with a prospect. Uh, it doesn't matter what you sell, what industry, what market, what vertical, not interested, right? What culture, what country. So when you're talking to a prospect, when you're with a prospect, consider this. What percentage of the time do you think that you're hearing the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So what percentage of the time when you're with a prospect are you hearing the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So what do you think, Will? Give, give me a guess. I, I would like to think it was relatively high, but I'm assuming it's kind of uh, 20, 30% that they're not trying to bullshit you. 
<laughs> so, so there were people that's listening that some people will have said, oh, I don't know, very optimistic individuals, no doubt, 80% perhaps. And then there'll be some of the people like you going, oh, yeah, I'd like to think he was 100, it's probably more like 20. And there'll be some other people screaming at, <laughs> at, their, at their device saying never, right? So it's somewhere between never and not 100, right? So let's agree that. Well, that's a problem. That, I mean, that's our first problem. So, so I'm going to give you a new definition for every sales professional out there in terms of what their job is. So there'll be some individuals that think, well, my job is to sell photocopiers. And there'll be some people that think my job is to sell pharmaceuticals and, and so on and so forth. Right. And I'm going to say that your primary objective is to get to the truth. That's that's your number one job. Well, well, if they're not prepared not willing, not able to tell you 100% of the truth 100% of the time, then, then our job is to get to the truth. Because prospects and clients will tell us a version of the truth, their version of the truth, that they believe it's in their best interest to have us believe. Does that make sense? It makes total sense. So what, what happens is sales guys, sales professionals, so when I say guys, I mean ladies, <laughs> chaps, okay, uh, go out into the world. And, and they interact with prospects and clients and they have, you know, really good conversations built, built on trust and all of that good stuff. So I'm coming at this from a good place. But the, but the fact of the matter is that sales individuals uh, and their prospects and clients were not always on the same page. And, and, and typically, uh, as the sales professional, I'm a nice guy. You a nice guy? I will think you are, right? Most people listening to this are nice guy. You only have a nice audience, right? So we're a fairly trusting bunch. And so we go out and meet with a the prospect. They tell us a version of the truth. And let's be generous and say 75% of the truth. And then we take that information and we go and do something with it. We'll prepare a quotation. We'll, we'll, we'll give them some unpaid consultancy as we talk about in, at Sandler, right? So we'll, 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 we'll base our responses on the information that they give us, but it's not all of the truth. And, uh, and so I'm going to argue that your value as a sales professional is, is reliant on discovering, let's be generous and say, he's giving you 75% of the truth. It's, it's discovering that other 25, because the bit that they don't necessarily want you to know is where the magic lies. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Let, let me jump in here for a second, because sure. is the goal of all this then to assume that they are not being truthful with us? And you know, perhaps they're doing this consciously because they want leverage for negotiations or whatever else uh, down the line. But is the goal then to, is the goal either to assume that this is happening and so go around the lies and uncover the information whichever way we can? Or is the goal to help them tell us the truth and not lie, if that makes sense? to help them discover the truth right and so so we have kind of a mantra there's, there's there's a few mantras that we have and you know these are more more revealed in the book and, I, and i'll tell you a couple just so you kind of get the wavelength of it or kind of get the the sense of it so if we go into every sales negotiation i don't want us to all become skeptics right and so cynical i don't i don't want that to be the case but so let's 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 our our watchwords be Let's be curious, be skeptical, and not be attached to the outcome, right? So be curious means ask lots of questions. Be skeptical means question answers, right? And then be not attached to the outcome because it's our, it's our, it's our connection or, 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 or enthusiasm to get the deal that actually crashes our equal business stature. When we become too attached to the outcome, we lose our business stature, we lose our objectivity, and then we stop asking questions and we start answering questions. And that answering questions doesn't get us any further down the line towards the truth. So I want people to, I, I'm not at all trying to trap anybody and get them to, you know, I don't want the angle poised lamp. I don't want it to be an interrogation and say, you tell me <laughs> the truth, right? Or we won't let the children out the, out the trunk of the car, right? So I'm not. It, I don't want it to be in the least bit aggressive. I want it to be very conversational. But the fact of the matter is we have to go in with open eyes and recognize that what they're telling us isn't necessarily the case. It's a version of the truth. And it's our job to help them discover the truth. So, so rule number one is be curious. Lots of questions. Be skeptical. Question answers. And don't be attached to the outcome. And rule number two is last point and then we'll get on to some maybe some specific questions or why this is the case 
depending on where you want to take the interview. So um, they never believe what you tell them. They rarely believe what you show them. They'll often believe what somebody else tells them, but they always believe what they tell themselves. So what does that mean? That means stop trying to sell people things. Stop trying to tell them stuff. Feature function benefit doesn't work because it's your data, not theirs. But, but they always believe what they tell themselves. So it's your job to help them come to discover that you're the right solution. And it's a bit like, you know, Will, have you ever been to a specialist? You know, you go to the doctor and the doctor says, oh, that's a nasty rash. Not quite sure how to deal with that. Right. And then sends you to the specialist. Right. Um, what I want us to be is that specialist. And if you think about that specialist that you've ever been to, and if you haven't, you can imagine that specialist acts and behaves in a certain way. And, and we tend to tell the specialist a bit more of the truth, don't we? When a specialist asks us questions, uh, you know, you, because you want to get rid of the nasty rash, right? So when they ask us questions, we tend to tell them the truth. And so our job then, to boil it down right to, to, to the point of this whole questioning strategy piece, yep. I want us to be seen by the other person as not just another vendor, not just another supplier, but as a trusted advisor. And there's a, you know, a vendor, if like, it's like a triangle where there's, you're one of many vendors down here, but there's only one of few trusted advisors up here. And I don't want you to be seen as a vendor. And if you look, smell, fact, uh, act, feel, and taste like every other one of your competitors, how are you going to be treated? So don't look and feel and smell and sound and taste like them. How do you differentiate yourself by the questions you ask? Okay, so we'll come back to questions for a second. We won't go too deep down this rabbit hole. But what do we need to do um, before, uh, uh, assume we're getting an in-person meeting here. What do we need to do before an in-person meeting so that we come across and act, behave, and I guess prepare to be the trusted advisor as opposed to rocking up as a salesperson and then trying to blag our way out of it with questions. That's right. That's a great question. So um, if any of if any of your listeners are listening and they go to a call without having put together a pre-call plan, they need to be fired. <laughs> Harris, I know, they need to be fired. You get an airplane, right? You fly on your holiday somewhere and you know, you know that that pilot has had a pre-call plan. He's registered a flight path. path. Uh, he's got a plan B. He knows what to do. He's been in, in simulator train, training. He, he, he's checked the engine and the fuel and all of that stuff. Uh, well, that's what, a, that's what a pilot does. That's what a lawyer does. An architect checks the foundations before he builds anything. A surgeon you know, has a pre-call plan. Everybody, every professional has a pre-call plan, and so should we, right? So included in that, therefore, is what's my objective of the call and once i know my objectives and my plan b and 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 i should now fashion start thinking about what are the key questions i'm going to ask and and there's a big difference between a good question and a bad question which is obviously maybe where we're going to go to next so so it's no good just just asking questions so an, another question for you will and i know this isn't how interviews work right but if i'm if i if i'm with an hour, if i got a, an hour with a prospect how many questions do you think i could ask in that one hour what do you think top of your head doesn't matter if i'm plowing into it 2 3 minutes an answer so kind of 20 30 questions <clears throat> right. So we're limited, right? It's not an, 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 a, a boundless number. It's a, there's a limited number of questions we can ask. And depending on whether they're tactical questions or strategic questions, because tactical questions typically have a short answer and strategic questions typically have a long answer. So let's say let's say 15 questions. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Well, if, if, if our real estate is 15 questions, it stands to reason to me, therefore, that, you know, one of the ways I'm going to differentiate myself from my competitors when I'm talking to this uh, client or prospect is um, I want I want me to have asked 15 really good questions, whereas everybody else is just going to ask average questions, because here's the thing, here's the critical thing, that your value as a salesperson is determined by the information you gather, not the information you give. So the, inf the quality of the information you gather is entirely determined by the quality of the question you ask. So if I go to a prospect and say, hey, Mr. Prospect, quick question. How long have you been the CEO of ABC company? 
in, intuitively we think, well, that's a good question. That's actually a terrible question. Because if I've only got 12 or 15 questions to ask, any question when I can get the answer on LinkedIn, you know, Google search, a website, literature, is a waste of time. And all of your competitors are saying, tell me a little bit about the markets you serve. It's such a dreadful question, right? So, so in our pre-call plan, I want us to have written down uh, in like, a, like on our notebooks, right? Or, or however we do it with CRM or whatever, whatever we, we're using, right? I want us to have written down, what are my goals? What's my objective for the call? What would be five or six tactical, good tactical, not dumb tactical, good tactical questions? five or six good strategic questions in advance. Why? Because once you have all of these questions laid out in front of you before you go in, then when you ask a question, you are, you can absolutely be paying attention, very active listening instead of thinking, what's my next question going to be? Cause you've already, you've already got them laid out. So that's the first thing to say. The second thing to say is whatever you, whoever you are, whatever industry you're in, whatever you sell, you get asked the same 20 questions in a slightly different pair of pants, right? So if I'm selling, I don't know, uh, pharmaceuticals in Reading, right, to, to GPs, right, I'm typically going to get asked the same kinds of questions, day in, day out, same 20 questions. So another thing I'd like us all to do, right, for your homework, right, is to, for the next week, write, a, write down on a piece of card or somewhere, all the questions you get asked, right? Now, for every question, there is a motive behind it. If a, if a prospect says to me, hey, Antonio, how many offices has, has your business got? How, how many offices has Sandler got? And I say, oh, great question, Mr. Prospect, 275, because we've got 275 offices around the globe. I've learned nothing, and he's learned 275. Now, 275, in his view, might be the perfect number. Oh, that's exactly the right number I was hoping to hear. It's more likely that he thinks, gosh, these guys are probably going to be expensive. Or it might be that he thinks, oh, I'm going to be a very small fish in a big pond. Or it might be he thinks, you know, it might be that he thinks, oh, great, because I've got a guy in New York and I've got a guy in Miami and they can train them both, right? The point is, until I know the motive for him asking me a question, I should never answer it. So when we get asked a question, one of the things I want us to do is write down the 20 questions that we get asked and then try and figure out with a reversing question, which is something like, hey, great question, Will. Of all the questions you could ask me right now, why is that one important? In other words, my you ask me a question, I'm reversing it, reversing the flow of the information because my answer ends in a question mark to find out if you then say, oh, because I've got a guy in New York and I've got a guy in Miami, can you train them both? Well, now I can give him a better answer. Does that make sense? That makes total sense. So let, let's let's stop here for a second. There's a ton to go sure. at. Before, <laughs> uh, two things. One, when we narrow it down that we've only got 15, maybe 10 questions to, to ask, that was a light bulb moment for me of, I need to really think about these questions as opposed to going in willy nilly and maybe I've got a plan. Maybe we're just going to have a bit of conversation and you know maybe we're going to build a bit of rapport and that's 15 minutes and and then when we get into it then you only got seven questions so you know you 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 can perhaps be doing yourself a bit of disservice by faffing around and obviously there's a balance here and it depends on relationships and all that kind of stuff but that was interesting to me the other thing was motivations behind questions now when we are asking questions and we have a objective for the meeting, perhaps we have a plan B or, you know, a BATNA or kind of whatever acronym we want to throw at these kind of things. Um, do we always ask questions that not necessarily push, not necessarily close ended questions, but we are, are we always asking questions that are motivated by getting someone to a certain place? Or are we treating it more like an experiment of we're having this hypothesis? that this is where we want to get them, but we are genuinely trying to see and uncover uh, a little bit more about them to see if that is the right place. Well, we try it. That's a great question. And I, 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 I'm, I'm tempted after what I've just said to reverse it, but I won't. <laughs> so I'll, I will answer it. So it's I'll, I'll just question. reverse it right back at you. Now I've learned <laughs> yeah. how to do that. Yeah, right. So um, our ob uh, the objective is to see the world through their eyes, is to understand the world through their eyes. Now, that may mean that we're not the right solution for them. That's why we have to be not attached to the outcome, right? So, and that's okay, because we're not for everybody. 
And if we go around trying to force fit ourselves into everybody's life, then then we're going to fail because we're going to be a jazz hands, pushy, bullshit sales guy. And that's the last thing I want us to be. So the objective is to see the world through their eyes for them to tell you really what's going on. So then you're trying to solve real problems, not phantom issues, not half truths. And and so 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 um, so our objective is to get to the truth, as we've mentioned, to see the world through their eyes and to be a trusted advisor, which 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 means that sometimes right now we might not be the right solution. That's just a fact of the life and fact of life. And and if we go around because nobody likes a sales guy. Right. And 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 everybody knows it's okay to lie to a sales guy and still get to heaven. Right. And even you and I'm going to I'm going to guess that you're a nice guy. Well, right. So when Most you. Of the time. Yeah. But when you imagine you're going to go and buy a car. When when and the, the second you step into the into the garage or the, the dealership, the second you step in, you've taken you've taken two steps. What happens? Get hounded. Right. Right. And do you go, oh, thank God you're here. Here's my budget. Here's exactly who I'm talking to. Here's what. Do you tell the truth? No, you tell your version of the truth. So all, all I want them to do is to see the world through your eyes, understand exactly what your issues are, and then figure out whether or not you might be a good fit. And maybe sometimes you're not. Okay, so let's get, let's get real practical with this with some specific yeah. kind of scenarios and questions. What do we do or what questions do we ask or how do we even perhaps ask them or frame up the conversation if perhaps we've, perhaps we've dealt with someone low down the food chain, we know that we can solve their problem or product services as a good fit for them, and we get pushed up to the boss, the end decision maker, whatever we want to call them, and they are not giving us – maybe they're, they're holding back because they want to negotiate on things or they're holding back because they see us as a salesperson – there's not perhaps that trust there. What can we do or what questions can we ask to kind of level the playing field and align and frame ourselves up as, you know, I'm literally here to help you? Yeah, yeah. So that's that's a really good question. So we could have come in at a certain level and we've been bumped up. And so there's there's, there's a few things to do. Well, first of all, one of the, 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 the best and quickest way that we've ever found in 50 years to build trust very, very, very quickly is, is to actually say something that's against our best interest. And one of the things that we say against our best interest is, hey, um, let's and I'm going to tell you how to ask that question in a second. But, but the principle is this. Let's see. Let's spend a little bit of time to figure out whether or not we might be a good fit. And if we're not a good fit, that's fine. I'm OK with that. I'm OK with a no. And so I'll still love you and you'll still be on my Christmas card list. So that uh, another thing that we could say is, you know, we're, we're a little bit ex, you know, expensive or, or, or slightly more expensive than, than the best price that you can get. Or, or, you know, it takes a long time for us to get the, the proposition right or anything that we call kind of exploding the bomb, which is maybe not in my best interest to say that builds trust because if you say something against your best interest, which is what a trusted advisor would do, then it, it actually helps to build trust. So uh, an example might be, and, and this says a few things all at the same time, if you think about it. So this is, this is a question, what you mentioned negotiating, right? Because most people want to negotiate. Uh, and that's, that, that's, that, that is true, that most people expect to have to face a price conversation at some point down the line and it comes in a few different pair of pants sometimes it says what you insult my children that's that's outrageous that's so expensive forget it to maybe as, as, as subtle as could you just try and sharpen your pencil just a little bit more right and everything in between and so early on because we know that's going to happen. We know that's going to come down the line, or rather we should at least anticipate it. So early on in a conversation with a prospect, I'll ask this question. I will say, hey, Mr. Prospect, could you spend a couple of minutes? Because help me understand something. Now, other than price, which of course is critical, what other criteria are you going to be using when you're, um, what other criteria are you going to be using when you're making the decision of who you're going to select for the next 
you know, uh, partner for, for this project, for example. So other than price, which, of course, is critical, what are the things that could be reputation, proximity, return on investment, geography? Who knows? Right. And if the guy goes, no, just price. And you go, yeah, of course. But what other criteria? And the guy goes, no, it's price only. Well, good. Well, it's great. Now, now you know that you know how to behave. So you might go, well, we're, we're never the cheapest. What ever, ever. Why do you think that might be? And if the guy goes, no idea, don't care. I think it's time to leave, right? Do you know what I mean? Right. So, so, um, and, and, and if, and if the guy goes, no, it's only price, then you go, well, we've been doing this for 38 years. We're never, ever in all instances going to be the cheapest you can possibly find. So, so we're, maybe we're not for you in this instance. Is it over? And, and often you'll find, well, no, I'm not saying it's over. And now the conversation keeps going. So if, so, if price is your issue, typically, then explode that bomb early. If it's if it's the so when I first came to Miami five years ago, and, and, and we we opened the office, I used I used to go around saying to my prospects, "Hey, listen, we we're brand new in this market. When you talk to me, you're talking to the business. When you look behind me, it doesn't look like the cast of Gandhi, right? And so I'm not well networked in the area." I don't have a little black book of millions of, of connections. And so if that's going to preclude us from doing business together, then that's fine. Let's let's shake hands, walk away. And, you know, maybe I'll come back in three years time. Is that going to be a problem? And, and no one ever said yes. And will that that now beat that up so that when in two weeks time, when I'm giving a price, he can't say, but it's just you. Right. Because I've already dealt with it. That makes sense. That makes total sense. And. The questions that you're asking here are yeah. perhaps difficult questions to ask, especially if we're not used to asking uh, these kind of questions. Clearly, they're important, and that might even separate ourselves from the competition. If we go to tender and someone comes in and asks all these wet, wishy-washy questions, and we can be more assertive with how we're going about things. Obviously, it shows that we're confident in ourselves, our product or service, and that kind of subliminally will translate into kind of more trust potentially. But with that said, Antonio, what it's one thing to say all that how do we become more assertive in our questioning and how do we become more comfortable asking the difficult questions because it seems like the way you were going through this then you asked one question where softer people or softer questioners would perhaps ask five to get to the same point yeah right that's that's a really good question so that segues beautifully and anybody listening going to think they planned this. <laughs> so that segues beautifully into this. So, so, so let me ask people listening, what is the single most important question of all the questions we can possibly ask? And I am coming to answer your question. I promise will the most important question. There are people now shouting at their radios, right? And, and like in the car going, they're all shouting, why? Why is the most important question? That's the worst question. They're going to be saying, um, uh, uh, tell me more. That's the, that's the worst. Okay, so the, the, to answer your question, here's the answer to, to my question. The single most important question of all questions for any salesperson to ask, write this down if you're listening. First of all, before we can ask all of these questions, we first have to get permission to ask all of these questions, because if we haven't got permission to ask all these questions, then it's going to feel from his side of the table or her side of the table. Right. It's going to feel like an interrogation. And nobody likes the feel of that. Right. I don't know if you've ever been arrested by the feds. Nope. Will. Uh, OK, well, they haven't okay. found me yet. <laughs> Well, there's a difference between an interview and an interrogation, right? You instinctively feel that those two things, I think you know if you've been interrogated, right? And so- and an let, Let's just stop on this. And I, I'm, yeah. we might lose our train of thought, so I'll try and bring us back. But what is the difference between uh, an interview and interrogation? It seems to me that the difference would be between the two would perhaps be open-ended questions versus closed-ended questions. Oh, great. So when I spoke to the the FBI over here, and was, was it, when I was researching the book and I was asking exactly that question, I said to them, what is the difference? And they are very clear, right? So this is a really good thing to learn. That, that an interview, right, which is okay, everybody's relaxed and everybody's cool and everybody's like non-threatening or aggressive, an interview, you know, uh, helping them with their inquiries, they're just trying to figure out, right, they're just trying to figure out what happened. 
what the what the what the sequence of events was and what, what people's motives were and everything. And interrogation is specifically designed to get you to incriminate yourself, right? That's that's all they're trying to do. All they're trying to do is to get you to say something that's against your best interest. And 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 we don't we don't want him to feel he's trapping me. He's trying to get to the truth, right? Because if he feels that it's an interrogation, he's going to close down. So that's why it's important that we get permission to ask all of these questions. And it's it's just really simple. And it just sounds like this, right? And this is real early on. You shake hands, you say hello, you talk about the weather and the price of fish for about 30 seconds to two minutes. That's all. Bonding and rapport. If you've got an hour's meeting and you're still in bonding and rapport in 58 minutes, right, you you completely screwed this this appointment up, right? So very soon after, you've got to say a couple of things. You've got to say, anyway, should we get down to business? That doesn't offend anybody. And then you say, before we, before we get going, and now because everybody needs a because, right? So you say, in order for me to see the world through your eyes, Will, is it going to be okay if we ask you a bunch of questions, right? Some of them might be a little bit tricky and some of them you might not want to answer and that's okay, but are you going to be comfortable with that? And then you're going to ask the single most important single word in sales. Are you ready for it? Fair, right? So when you say, in order for me to see the world through your eyes so I can maybe give you the best advice, figure out whether it might be a good fit or not, I'm, I'm going to ask, have to ask you a bunch of questions. Uh, some of them might be a little bit tricky and some of them might be a little bit uncomfortable, in which case just tell me and we'll move on. But are you going to be comfortable? Are you going to be comfortable with that? Is that fair? People agree to fair because we are programmed for fairness, right? And when you say fair, you're, you're comfortable with that. Does that make sense? Is that all right? Is that OK? People agree. And once they've agreed to answer a bunch of questions, now you've got permission to ask questions. So now when you're asking questions, he's not thinking this is like a bloody interrogation. Does that make sense? That makes total sense. That's really useful because I, and I, I, anyway, it probably would have been a better question for me to ask at the top of the show. But that was at the back of my mind of how do we get, because it's almost like literally physically in the room, we want to be on the same side of the desk sat next to them, don't we? Going through this as opposed to sat opposite them if we were to visualize it that way. And that very quickly and succinctly um, kind of puts us in that side by side kind of partner or consultative position, right? And now, so to answer the, your previous question, so now that we've done that, I don't want to say a move because that feels like a technique, but now, now that we have that explicit agreement, comes back to your question earlier. So now, because you said, how do we, how do we ask all of these questions? Now that you've got, you've been given permission to ask questions, then ask away. Make sure the smart questions, because you're going to plan that up front, right? Make sure the smart questions, not dumb questions, because if you ask a dumb question, do you go up in his estimation or down? You go. But if you ask a smart question, do you go up or down? You go up, right? So I'm perfectly okay. If I ask a, a prospect a question and he says this, in fact, on my pre-call plan, my objective is to get him to say three times, man, that's a good question, right? Or, oh my God, that's such a good question. Or, I have no idea. If I can get him to think in a different way, it's, we call it pattern interrupt, right? We're interrupting the pattern. We're not being like all of our competitors. So if I can get him to go, man, that's a good question, and mentally work hard, I, I, I'm becoming this, this trusted advisor, this equal business stature. I'm becoming not like any of my competitors. And, and, and if, you, if you don't differentiate yourself from your competitors by how you behave, I'll say this slowly for everybody to write this down. Um, if you don't differentiate yourself by how you behave, then the only way you can be differentiated is by what? Price. And that's the worst thing, right? So, so, so write this down, anybody listening. Different is better than better, right? Different is better than better. I want you to be different from your competitors so he's not looking for a better price. Love it. And I've got to ask this, and this uh, may be funny for the audience, and uh, feel free to kind of uh, break my heart with this, Antonio, but is there anything that I've done with my questions on this interview that could be better, that could have changed, uh, you know, that's really sucked and I shouldn't have done from your opinion on things? How can I possibly, how can I possibly answer that without you getting upset? I, I may get upset, but I'll, I'll get over it. So what I just did to you then was quite a sophisticated reverse, right? which is like, 
how do you tell someone they've got an ugly baby? It's tricky, right? Because like people don't want. So what you do is you say, well, can I say something without you getting upset? Like, so I said, how could I say that without you getting upset? And you said, bring it on. Right. So you've now given me permission to say something potentially a little bit painful. Right. Um, so, so that's called a universal. Yes. When you ask a question where the answer is, always, I'm going to answer your question, by the way. So let me give you a couple more examples of that. And then I will answer your question. So if I said to a prospect. Like sign, huff and puff and put my hand on my chest and say, hey, well, can I tell you my biggest fear? What's the other guy going to say? Sure. Well, I was thinking about this meeting on the way over today. Do you want to know what I was thinking? Yes. Um, you got you got 30 seconds for a super quick story. Yes. Why not? So these are universal yeses, right? Where 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 you get permission to say the thing that you want to say, right? So you said to me, could I have done anything better? <laughs> yeah. And so I'm going to say you could have read the book. <laughs> Right, right. Because at the end of my book, uh, and maybe again, people are listening and go, they bloody planned this, right? Um, there are 125. There's, there's, a, there's a tool. There's a free link to a tool with 125 really smart questions, right? So if I were you, um, I'd have a look at that list, right? And I would um, pick the the five or six that you think are, are the trick, because you've asked me lovely, easy, soft questions, right? So, so um, when but you're we're, we're not battling, right? We're, there's nothing on the line here. It's either you're you're trying to win, so I'm I don't feel like I need to build trust with you. If you're, you know, you're, you're clearly a very pleasant guy. If you're a bit of an arsehole, the show just doesn't go out, and you've wasted your time. You wasted mine. Oh, right. So I didn't know that possible i would have been even nicer <laughs> yeah but, but I'm, I'm i'm trying to put it into context here so because i'm going to ask you a, a question to wrap things up with so it's, this is a bit of a different dynamic for me to kind of I, there's a few interviews there's an interview with jordan Bel belfort uh wolf of wall street f fame didn't go out because we didn't get on and i pushed him and he tried to push me back and it was just awkward it was a weird weird hour of my time that i'll never get back and there's, there's been very few other interviews like that so this is a, this is a weird one to kind of um, to use in a, as an example. But with, with all that said, in context for the audience, yeah. what questions would then, out of these 120 odd questions, would you suggest that I should have been using in this interview? Um, I think, uh, I think, well, I, I think maybe what are the five or six best questions? Maybe would have been a good question for, you know, for most people that are, because people listening, I'm hoping are taking I don't know whether they listen, eating breakfast or maybe taking notes or driving in the car or, 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 or you know, so things like what's the, what's the single most important question, which is like, can I get permission to ask, you know, to ask, to ask lots of questions. Um, maybe we could have done the um, what's, you know, well, well, tell me what never to ask, which is what we sometimes, you know, get asked. What, what, what should we ask? Um, uh, but I have to say largely, genuinely, um, I, I've, I've enjoyed all of your questions. I, th I think that I think they've certainly helped your listener get a really good understanding. I think <laughs> you don't need to stroke my ego. I was, it was a it was a genuine question I was asking. No, no, and that's a genuine answer because the re the reality is, in an hour, you can only go an inch deep and a mile wide, right? Yeah. And so we haven't got too bogged down in any particular area, which I think is which I think is useful. So good man, yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah, I'm always trying to get. I'm less bothered about specific questions on when we do shows sure. like this. I'm more interested in the frameworks and there's a couple of things that I picked up in here of not being attached to the outcome changes every question you ask, right? When you're willing to walk out of the room, immediately you're elevated over everyone else who's gonna, gonna suck up to the individual and do all that bonding, which reduces their ability. This is the other thing that I picked up on from this conversation, Antonio, of if we've got the ability to ask 10 great questions and they've only got the time to ask four because they're sucking up at the beginning of the conversation, we're right. already miles ahead of these individuals, aren't I, we? Miles ahead. and and. The other, the interesting point that you just make is most of our, let's say, non-question alert sales guys. So it's kind of the BS kind of like jazz hands, push, push, push sales guy. They actually ask a lot more questions. They ask like, how long have you been here? Is that your selfish? Are those your grandchildren? How long have you been in this office? Uh, what markets do you operate in? Who are your biggest competitors? They ask a lot more 
very superficial questions. So they'll ask maybe 30 dumb questions where I would rather we ask six really smart questions. Good. Well, that's a good thing to end the show on and, and leave with the audience with. And with that, Antonio, I've got one final question that I ask everyone that comes on the show. And that is, if you could go back in time and speak to your younger self, what would be the one piece of advice you'd give him about selling that would help him become incredible at sales? But it can't be anything to do with, I guess, question-based uh, skills or anything like that. Um, I think I would say learn a sales process, figure out a sales process. It doesn't have to be my process. I'm not trying to sell my process, but if every buyer has a process, every single one, if you don't have your sales process, you are obliged to follow their buying process. And that's, that serves them well, but not you well. Cause like in the buyer seller dance, if you don't know how to dance, who leads the dance, the other guy. So learn us become a ninja, find a sales process you like, and become a bloody black belt ninja at that process. Because most sales processes are good. I, I think ours is terrific, of course. But learn a process. Um, I, I would have sold billions with a B more if I'd have learned a process. I learned our process right earlier. And obviously, I've got to say, learn to ask better questions. Good stuff. Well, with that, tell us a little bit more about the book, where we can find it, and then where we can find out more about you as well, Antonio. So well, you can find the book in lots of great places. So it's Asking Questions, The Sandler Way, S-A-N-D-L-E-R, The Sandler Way. Um, check us out on LinkedIn. Check out my um, website, www. Does anybody say that anymore? Just absolute.sandler.com, uh, LinkedIn, or send me an email on antonio.garrido at sandler.com. Uh, and if anybody wants to send me an email to antonio.garrido at sandler.com, I will send them a free chapter of the book. And if you like it, you can buy it. Give me a five-star review on Amazon. And if you don't like it, no harm, no foul, but you can have a free chapter of the book. How's that? Good stuff. Well, I'll link to all of that in the show notes to this episode over at salesman.org. And with that, Antonio, I really appreciate this. I really enjoyed the conversation, I'm mate. Really, and I wanna, really, thank you for joining us on the Salesman Podcast. Thanks very much. Keep rocking. Thanks, Will. 